Welcome to episode six of our series, Master the Beat from Basic EKG to Life-Saving ACLS. In today's episode titled The SA Node Blues, we'll dive into sinus arrhythmias and explore what happens when the SA node isn't functioning effectively. We'll break down how these arrhythmias occur, their impact on the heart's rhythm, and what to look for on the EKG strip. An arrhythmia, also known as a dysrhythmia, refers to any deviation from the normal sinus rhythm. Sinus arrhythmias specifically originate in the sinoatrial or SA node and result from abnormalities in how the SA node discharges electrical impulses or how those impulses are conducted through the heart. Common types of sinus arrhythmias included in this episode include sinus arrhythmia, sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, sinus arrest, sinus exit block. Let's do a quick overview of the OG of the rhythm's normal sinus rhythm. Remember this rhythm originates from a healthy SA node, which is the inherent pacemaker of the heart. Normal sinus rhythm has these defining characteristics. It has a regular rhythm. The rate is going to be between 60 to 100 beats per minute. The P waves will be sinus. There will be one P wave for every QRS. Our PR interval is going to be between 0.12 to 0.20 seconds, and our QRS should measure 0.10 seconds or less. Sinus tachycardia occurs when the SA node generates electrical impulses at an accelerated rate, typically between 100 to 160 beats per minute. Despite the increased heart rate, all other ECG parameters remain within normal limits. Sinus tachycardia is a normal physiological response in certain situations, such as exercise or stress. It starts and stops gradually, typically benign. It resolves once the underlying cause is addressed. Although this is not an exhaustive list, here are some common causes I think about in critical care. Fever, pain, anxiety, hypoxia, hypovolemia, hypotension, heart failure, drugs that either increase a sympathetic activity or decrease parasympathetic activity. It's also important that we mention the formula cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Cardiac output is the total volume of blood pumped by the heart in one minute. Uh, the volume is the amount of blood pumped out of the left ventricle with each heartbeat. And then the heart rate is the number of heartbeats per minute. According to this formula, if you increase the heart rate or the stroke volume, you increase the cardiac output. For example, if a patient's heart rate goes up due to fever or stress, the cardiac output will also rise if the stroke volume stays the same. Alternatively, if a patient is receiving medication to help the heart pump more blood per beat, increasing stroke volume, that will also boost cardiac output. This formula is essential in critical care because changes in cardiac output help us determine if a patient's heart is pumping efficiently enough to supply the body with the oxygen it needs. Let's do a practice strip to visually interpret sinus tachycardia's characteristics on a ECG strip. Our first step is always to determine whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. So how do we determine if the rhythm is regular? The key is the R to R interval, which is the time between two consecutive R waves, the sharp upward deflection representing ventricular depolarization. In sinus tachycardia, these R to R intervals should remain consistent throughout the strip. You can check for regularity by measuring the distance between each R wave. One method is to take a piece of paper or calipers, mark the distance between the two R waves, and then move across the strip. If the R to R intervals stay the same across the entire strip, the rhythm is regular. However, slight variations of up to one to two small boxes are considered normal for your R to R interval to still be considered regular. If the variation exceeds two small boxes, you can classify the rhythm as irregular. In this example on the screen, you'll notice that the R to R intervals are nearly identical. They are approximately 14 small boxes in between each R to R interval confirming a regular rhythm, which is consistent with sinus tachycardia. 
Step two involves estimating the heart rate. But before we can do that, it's important first to confirm that the strip we're analyzing covers six seconds. On standard ECG paper, time is marked using small and large boxes. To verify that the strip is six seconds long, we can either count 30 large boxes, since each large box represents 0 0.20 seconds, or we can look for two sets of three second hash marks at the top or bottom of the strip. Once you've identified a six second strip, you can use it to estimate the heart rate by counting the number of R waves, the peaks of the QRS complexes in the strip. Multiply this number by 10 to estimate the heart rate in beats per minute. In this example on the screen, how many R's do you count in a six second window of our practice strip? There's 11. 11 times 10 is 110 beats per minute. In step three, examine and compare all P waves. The P waves in the strip are upright and positive in lead two, which is a hallmark of normal electrical conduction originating from the SA node. Additionally, the P waves are smooth, rounded, and maintain a uniform shape throughout the entire ECG strip. This uniformity indicates that the electrical signals are consistently generated by the SA node. Next, we assess the P wave consistency. In sinus tachycardia, as seen in this practice strip, just like in normal sinus rhythm, each P wave is followed by a QRS complex. This confirms the proper conduction and origin of the impulses from the SA node. In summary, the P waves present in this rhythm strip are confirmed to be sinus P waves, indicating the rhythm is being driven by the SA node. Now, we move on to step four, assessing the PR interval. We'll begin by carefully measuring the PR interval from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex. Once we've measured one PR interval, we will compare each PR interval across the strip to check for the consistency. This helps us determine whether there are conduction delays or abnormalities. To measure the PR interval, start at the beginning of the P wave where it leaves the baseline and then measure to the start of the QRS complex. In this specific example, I've marked the start of the PR interval with vertical line at the beginning of the P wave and another line at the end of the PR interval just before the QRS complex begins. The line connecting them represents the entire PR interval, allowing us to clearly visualize the measurement. I have also placed one small dot in each small box that is the PR interval. How many squares or small boxes do you count in between these two points? If you said four, you are correct. If we multiply four small squares by 0 0.04 seconds, we have a 0 0.16 second PR interval. Do you remember if this is normal? A normal PR interval is 0.12 seconds to 0.20 seconds. So yes, our rhythm strip had 0.16 seconds as it's a consistent PR interval. We're not done with step four yet. Next, we need to assess of the consistency of the PR intervals across the entire strip. This means comparing each PR interval to ensure that they remain consistent throughout the rhythm strip. This is a crucial step that, in my experience, many professionals tend to skip, leading to confusion. Ensuring consistency in the PR interval is the key for accurate rhythm analysis and detecting any condition abnormalities. In our example, we have a consistent PR interval which measures approximately 0.16 seconds across the strip, indicating proper conduction from the atria to the ventricles. Step number five is to measure the QR interval. In the example on the screen, I follow the same process as I did for the PR interval by enlarging the strip to enhance the view for easier measuring. I've marked the beginning and end of the QRS complex with a red line, and the line connecting these two points represents the QRS duration. In the enlarged portion of the EKG strip, I see two small boxes, which if I multiply with 0.04 seconds, I have a QRS width of 0.08 seconds. If I compare all the QRS durations on the six second strip, 
I do have a variation of 1.5 to 2 small boxes giving me a 0.06 to 0.08 seconds for the QRS complex durations on the complete strip. Since the difference is only a half a box, the QRS interval is still considered normal. To summarize our practice strip EKG analysis, we said the rhythm was regular, the rate was 110 beats per minute, the P waves were sinus, there was one P wave for every QRS, the PR interval averaged at 0.16 seconds across the strip consistently, and the QRS complex was about 0.08 seconds on our practice strip. ST and T waves were normal. When we look at the sinus tack characteristics, the only thing that is different than normal sinus rhythm is that the heart rate is greater than 100 to about 160. In our practice strip, the rate was 110 and everything else was normal. So this is sinus tachycardia. In the latest 2023 American Heart Association guidelines, it indicates that sinus tachycardia is typically a physiological response rather than a primary rhythm disturbance requiring direct intervention. The primary focus is treating the underlying cause, such as pain, fever, hypoxia, hypovolemia, or other stressors, rather than managing the sinus tachycardia itself. The key points for ACLS is that sinus tachycardia typically does not require rhythm specific intervention unless it results in hemodynamic instability. The tachycardia will resolve once the underlying cause is addressed. ACLS algorithm for tachycardia with a pulse focuses on the patient's symptoms and hemodynamic stability. If the patient is symptomatic, example, experiencing hypotension, altered mental status, signs of shock, further treatment is initiated based on the ACLS protocols for unstable tachycardia. Medications such as beta blockers calcium channel blockers may be considered in certain cases if tachycardia persists despite resolution of the primary cause. Our next sinus arrhythmia is sinus bradycardia. Sinus bradycardia occurs when the SA node generates electrical impulses at a decelerated rate, typically less than 60 beats per minute. Despite the decreased heart rate, all other ECG parameters remain within normal limits. So what to expect if you have a sinus bradycardia is that the rhythm is going to be regular, the rate will be 60 beats per minute or less, they will have sinus P waves with one P wave that precedes each QRS, the PR interval will be between 0.12 to 0.20 seconds, and the QRS duration will be 0.10 seconds or less, and we will have a normal ST and T wave. While sinus bradycardia can be normal response in athletes or during sleep, it can also indicate underlying conditions when symptomatic or persistent. Common causes include increased vagal tone, medications such as beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, hypoxia, heart block, or myocardial infarction. Now let's do a practice strip. Step one, is the rhythm regular or irregular? If I count all the small boxes in between the R to Rs, I have an average of 37 small boxes. Or if I use the hash mark method and I mark my hash marks using the first R to R interval, it actually marches out, giving me a regular rhythm. In step two, we estimate the heart rate. First, I notice that I have three red hash marks that indicate that my rhythm strip is a six second strip. Next, I'm gonna count the number of R waves, which I have five in my rhythm strip within that six second strip. Five times 10 equals 50. My estimated heart rate for this practice strip is 50. When I'm evaluating the P waves on the rhythm strip for step three, I see that there is one P wave for every QRS. Each P wave is upright, round, and uniform across the strip. So I have sinus P waves. For step number four in the rhythm analysis process, we'll begin by carefully measuring the PR interval from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex. Once we've measured the PR interval, we will compare each PR interval across the strip to check for consistency. This helps us determine whether there are any conduction delays or abnormalities. In this specific example, I've marked the start of the PR interval with a black vertical line at the beginning of the P wave and then another black vertical line at the end of the PR interval, just before the QRS complex begins. The line connecting them represents the entire PR interval, allowing us to clearly visualize the measurement. I've also placed 
one small red dot in each box that is in the PR interval. How many small squares do you count in between these two points? If you said four, you are correct. If we multiply four squares by 0 0.04 seconds, we have a 0 0.16 second PR interval. Do you remember if this is normal? Well, remember, for any sinus rhythms or arrhythmias, a normal PR interval should measure between 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds, which is three to five small squares. So yes, our PR interval of 0 0.16 seconds is within normal limit. But of course, we're not done with step four yet. Next, we need to assess the consistency of the PR interval across the entire strip. This means comparing each PR interval to ensure that they remain consistent throughout the rhythm strip. This is a crucial step that, in my experience, many professionals tend to skip, leading to confusion. Ensuring consistency in the PR interval is key for accurate rhythm analysis and detecting any conduction abnormalities. In our example, we have a consistent PR interval which measures 0.16 across the strip. This is normal for any sinus rhythm or arrhythmia. In step number five, we measure the QRS complex. In the example on the screen, I've marked the beginning of the QRS complex interval with a white line and the end of the QRS complex with another white line. The line connecting these two points represents the QRS duration, allowing us to measure how long ventricular depolarization takes. What do you calculate the QRS duration in this example? If you counted two small boxes and multiplied those two small boxes times 0 0.04, you have a QRS of 0 0.08. When I compare all the QRSs across the rhythm strip for consistency, they also have 0 0.06 to 0 0.08, which is within normal limits for any sinus rhythm or arrhythmia. In step six in the EKG rhythm analysis, we evaluate the ST segment and T wave. In the example on the screen, I've clearly marked the J point, which is where the QRS complex ends and the ST segment begins. I've also added the red dotted line to indicate the isoelectric line which serves as the baseline for comparison. In our example, the ST segment returns to the baseline as it should in a normal sinus rhythm or any sinus arrhythmia, indicating no significant elevation or depression. When further evaluating the T wave, it is normal in shape and size and upright in lead two, making this example show us a normal ST segment and T wave. To understand sinus bradycardia ACLS treatments, the guidelines by AHA say that symptomatic heart rate of less than 50 BPMs is what we would use the bradycardia with a pulse algorithm for. Once BLS has been established, the first line of medication is atropine. If atropine is ineffective, transcutaneous pacing is the next choice and or dopamine infusion or epinephrine infusion. Remember, causes for bradycardia could be myocardial ischemia, infarction, drugs, toxicologic like calcium channel blockers or beta blockers, digoxin, hypoxia, electrolyte abnormalities like hyperkalemia. For more information on ACLS guidelines for bradycardia with a pulse, make sure to become a member and get our exclusive content that talks about the in-depth ACLS process for bradycardia with a pulse. The next sinus dysrhythmia we will review is sinus arrhythmia. Sinus arrhythmia occurs when the sinus node discharges impulses irregularly. The heart rate may be normal range or slow. All other parameters are normal. The key characteristics include respiration's influence. Sinus arrhythmia is typically more pronounced during inspiration when the heart rate increases and slows down during expiration. It is more common in younger individuals and typically lessens with age. EKG findings include the R to R intervals vary with breathing, but P waves remain normal and upright before each QRS complex and the overall QRS duration and PR intervals remain within normal limit. There are no changes in the P waves, morphology, or PR intervals. 
It's important to understand that sinus arrhythmia is a natural variation in heart rate that occurs during breathing cycle. It is caused by the vagus nerve's influence on the heart rate during respiration, leading to variations in R2R interval. The clinical significance really is that sinus arrhythmia is generally benign and not considered a pathological arrhythmia. It does not require treatment as it is considered a normal physiological response to breathing especially in healthy individuals. It is important to distinguish sinus arrhythmia from more serious conditions like atrial fibrillation or heart block, which would involve irregularities in the P waves or inconsistent conduction from the atria to the ventricles. For ACLS, a sinus arrhythmia does not typically require interventions as it is not associated with a compromised cardiac output or perfusion. Most commonly observed in infants, children, and young adults, although it may occur in any age group, it does frequently occur along with sinus bradycardia in which the case it is usually called sinus arrhythmia with a bradycardic rate. On to our next practice strip. Let's start with step one, analyzing the rhythm's regularity. In this example, we are analyzing a rhythm strip with a sinus arrhythmia, where the key characteristics is an irregular rhythm. To assess this, we focus on the R to R intervals, the distance between the two consecutive R waves. On the screen, I have marked the R to R variations in different shades, representing the variation in time between heartbeats. You'll notice that the intervals vary from 19 to 26 seven small squares. This variation in the R to R interval is the hallmark of sinus arrhythmia, where the heart rate speeds up and slows down, often with breathing. Next, we need to estimate the heart rate by counting the QRS complexes in a six second strip. In this example, we have six QRS complexes within the six second strip. Since the six second method is a quick way to estimate heart rate, we will multiply the number of QRS complexes by 10, giving us 60 beats per minute. Step three, examine the P wave. We need to take a closer look at the P waves to determine if they are sinus P waves, meaning that they originate from the SA node. In this rhythm strip, each P wave is upright and positive in lead two, which is a key indicator of sinus origin. Furthermore, each P wave is followed by a QRS complex confirming normal conduction from the atria to the ventricles, the consistency in the shape and appearance of the P waves across the strip also points to them being sinus in origin, which is crucial in confirming sinus arrhythmia. Step 5. Measure QRS complex. In this step, we focus on the QRS complex, which represents ventricular depolarization. For accurate measurement, I've already marked the duration of QRS complex on the strip to guide you. In this example, the QRS complex measures two small boxes, which equals 0.08 seconds. This is within the normal range. The consistency of the QRS complexes across the strip further supports the findings that the rhythm, despite being irregular due to sinus arrhythmia, still follows normal ventricular conduction. In step six, we want to assess the ST segment and T wave. The J point, which we can see in this strip, the ST segment, does return to the iso electric line, which is important as it indicates that there is no ST elevation or depression, key signs of conditions like myocardial infarction or ischemia. The T wave is also normal. It's upright and consistent throughout the strip. This suggests that the ventricular repolarization is occurring as expected with no signs of electrolyte imbalances or other abnormalities. All these factors confirm that although the rhythm is irregular due to sinus arrhythmia, overall electrical conduction and repolarizations are functioning normally. As a reminder, a sinus arrhythmia is generally benign and not considered a pathological arrhythmia. It does not require treatment as it is considered normal physiological response to breathing, especially in healthy individuals. Next, let's talk about sinus pause. Sinus pause refers to a general term describing an unexpected interruption in the heart's basic rhythm characterized by one or more missing beats. Two specific arrhythmias fall under this category, sinus arrest and sinus exit block pause. In sinus arrest, the SA node fails to initiate an electrical impulse, which reflects an issue with the SA node's automaticity. Following the pause, the basic rhythm does not resume on time. Now with a sinus exit block pause, here the SA node generates an impulse, but it's blocked before it can exit the node. This reflects a problem with the SA node 
include conductivity. After the pause, the basic rhythm typically resumes on time. It's important to understand that a sinus arrest and sinus exit block can lead to bradycardia and a reduction in cardiac output, particularly in cases where multiple pauses occur. Symptomatic sinus pauses can present as syncope, dizziness, fatigue, or hypotension, making it essential for critical care providers to monitor closely. Treatment may include addressing reversible causes such as electrolyte imbalances or medications that impair SA node function, like beta blockers. For severe cases, pacemaker and insertion may be required to prevent further pauses and ensure adequate cardiac output. These conditions are important in critical care as prolonged or recurrent sinus pauses can lead to asystole or other serious arrhythmias that require immediate intervention. Close monitoring of ECG strips is essential to differentiate between the types of sinus pauses and determine appropriate treatment. Let's do a practice strip for sinus arrest versus exit block pause. As step one, of rhythm analysis, let's first determine if the rhythm is regular or irregular. In this case, we see a generally regular rhythm, but notice that the sixth complex is missing. This missing beat is a key to identifying whether this is sinus arrest or an exit block pause. The return of the seventh complex on time suggests we may be dealing with a sinus exit block rather than sinus arrest, where return wouldn't be on time. In step two, next we estimate the heart rate. Counting the number of QRS complexes within a six second strip, we find nine complexes. So don't forget that the number of QRS complexes you include when estimating a heart rate should only be within a six second strip. I see that the first QRS complex on the strip falls outside of my first hash mark, so we don't count the first QRS complex. That gives us a total of eight QRS complexes within a six second strip and multiple Multiply that by 10, giving us an estimated heart rate of 80 beats per minute. This is within normal range for the sinus node. In step three, now let's examine the P waves. In this strip, the P waves are sinus in origin, upright, rounded, and consistent across the strip, indicating the SA node is functioning properly before the pause. We can also observe that the P waves precede each QRS complex except during the dropped complex. In step four, we measure the PR interval. Across the strip, the PR interval is consistent and falls within normal range of 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. In this case, the PR interval is 0.16 seconds or four small boxes. Consistency in the PR interval further supports normal AV conduction. In step five, we're moving on to the QRS complex. We measure the QRS duration, which is 0.08 seconds or two small boxes. This is a normal QRS QRS duration indicating that ventricular depolarization is occurring as expected without any conduction delays through the ventricles. In step 6, we can evaluate the ST segment and T wave. In this strip, the ST segment returns to the isoelectric line with no evidence of elevation or depression ruling out any ischemic changes. The T wave is upright and normal, further confirming that repolarization is happening as expected. In conclusion, with the sixth complex dropped and the seventh returning on time, along with the consistent P waves, normal PR intervals, and QRS duration, this strip is indicated of a sinus exit block rather than sinus arrest. Sinus arrest would present with a pause and doesn't align with the expected timing of the next complex. To help you visually see the difference between these two, the first strip on the top here is the one we just evaluated. It is the normal sinus rhythm with a sinus block. And then the second strip, the blue one on the bottom, is going to be that sinus rhythm with sinus arrest, where you can see the R to R regularity is interrupted, but the rhythm does not resume on time after the pause. In the context of ACLS, identifying whether a patient has sinus arrest or sinus exit block is crucial, as both can lead to bradycardia or pauses in the heart's rhythm. The most critical concern is whether the patient is symptomatic due to the rhythm disturbance, especially if it leads to hemodynamic instability such as hypotension, altered mental status, or signs of shock. In sinus arrest, the SA node fails to generate an impulse for a brief period. This results in a pause where no P wave or QRS complex occurs. The key feature of sinus arrest is that the next P wave does not return on time, disrupting the regularity of the rhythm. This irregularity 
could lead to a significant pause in cardiac output, causing symptoms like dizziness or syncope. ACLS intervention. If the sinus arrest causes bradycardia and the patient is symptomatic, atropine is the first line of treatment. If atropine is ineffective, transcutaneous pacing, dopamine, or epinephrine may be needed to maintain adequate heart rate and perfusion. For recurrent or severe cases, a pacemaker may be required. For sinus exit block, in sinus exit block, the SA node generates an impulse, but it is blocked as it exits the node, preventing the signal from reaching the atria. The rhythm remains consistent as the next P wave returns on time which is the key difference from sinus arrest. The block can result in occasionally missed beats, but typically causes less disruption to cardiac output than sinus arrest. Treatment is similar to sinus arrest. If symptomatic bradycardia occurs due to the block, atropine is administered first, followed by pacing or infusions if necessary. In both conditions, it's essential to follow the bradycardia algorithm with a pulse in ACLS. This involves evaluating the patient's symptoms, securing their airway, and oxygenating and using appropriate pharmacologic or pacing interventions if the bradycardia persists or worsens. Our key takeaways for ACLS is to identify whether the pause returns on time, which is your sinus exit block, or does not return on time, which is your sinus arrest. In symptomatic cases, of bradycardia, initiate ACLS protocols with atropine as your first-line medication. Consider pacing if atropine fails or if the rhythm results in stable. Here is another version of how to manage symptomatic bradycardia caused by sinus pause in accordance with the algorithm symptomatic bradycardia in ACLS. For more detailed sinus node arrhythmias or for more practice strips, don't forget to become a member at www.novamindllc.com or through our YouTube channel to gain access to dozens of practice strips that will help you master rhythm strip analysis and ensure you're ready for any rhythm interpretation needed by your patients. It's important to highlight a few of the most common misconceptions rooted in racial essentialism within cardiovascular medicine. It's been long assumed that African Americans are biologically more prone to hypertension and heart failure. However, recent research emphasizes that environmental, social, and economic factors, rather than race, is the focus when analyzing these health disparities. Another significant issue is the use of race in cardiovascular disease risk prediction models. As Warwick et al. discuss, including race in these algorithms perpetuates the flawed belief that race is a biological determinant. This practice also leads to biased clinical decisions. Finally, socioeconomic status is a major determinant of cardiovascular outcomes, always more significant than race itself. Research shows that differences in heart disease between black and white patients are largely attributed to socioeconomic status rather than racial differences. For example, studies found that in low socioeconomic status areas, life expectancy differences between black and white patients with acute myocardial infarction were minimal, underscoring the importance of socioeconomic factors. These insights remind us that addressing health disparities requires moving beyond racial essentialism and focusing on real determinants of health such as socioeconomic conditions and access to health care. At Novamind LLC, our core values are firmly aligned with the American Medical Association's policies, which assert that there is no biological evidence of race and it is a social construct. We adhere to the AMA policies that advocate for the elimination of race as a proxy for ancestry, genetics, and biology in medical education, research, and clinical practice. This is why Novamind sets itself apart as the pioneer in health equity, education, and professional development through our unwavering commitment to these principles. Every course we create is designed to identify and challenge the ingrained biases that have historically influenced and continue to affect healthcare today. Our approach is not just about delivering content, it's about transforming, understanding, and establishing new guidelines for educating healthcare professionals.
And that concludes our episode on sinus dysrhythmias, where we discuss sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, sinus arrhythmia, and sinus pauses. Next time, we'll investigate atrial arrhythmias where the electrical activity does not originate from the SA node, but instead somewhere else in the atrium. In episode 7, titled, This Spark Isn't Sinus, Where Did I Come From? Unveiling atrial arrhythmias will uncover the causes, the characteristics, and the clinical significance of these arrhythmias, helping you understand how to detect and respond to them effectively. Don't forget to subscribe, and if you want to view more practices, go to www novamindllc.com to gain access, exclusive rhythm strips, and tutorials to sharpen your EKG interpretation skills.